Couch. Okay, let me see. Today is February 29th, 1984. This is Joe's card. Interview at Mr. Irvin Hurst. Well, Mr. Hurst, first of all, I'd like to know where you were born. Well, that's like that. That's like those W people on the WPA rules running those interviews. Mm -hmm. I was born in Terre Haute, Indiana. And when's your birthday? I was born on Thanksgiving Day, November 24, 1904. Oliver would object by lit a cigar in his high office. Yeah. Let me have an ice tray. Okay, I was, I was gonna go get you one. Oh, it's all right. Um, I, 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 I'll find one. Go ahead, I'll yeah. try to answer your question. When'd you come to Oklahoma? March 16th, 1913. I lived March 16th, 1913. How come you came to Oklahoma? I thought I was a teaming, teaming contractor for C.B. Schaefer. What's a teaming contractor? Do you know what a team is? Yeah. Well, take two horses and hook them up, and you've got a team. And you're in the oil fields. C.B. Schaefer's a big independent operator, originally from Pennsylvania, <clears throat> who brought in Wheeler Number 1 in March 1912 on the north edge of what is now Drumright, and that opened the Cushing Drumright Field. Lots of people don't know it, but the Cushing Drumright Field lubricated World War I. And your so father March the 16th, 1913 was a Sunday. There were about two inches of snow on the ground. Um, a month later, we moved to Drumright, which was then three months old. That was April 1913. Come by train? Yeah. What did your father do as a team contractor? A team contractor, they were hauling. What were they hauling? Well, how the hell do you think you're hauling an oil field? You were hauling oil field supplies. You were, you were hauling casing, any, anything that, that uh, you know, all the things that you. The things that you see on trucks today, we were hauling with teams. And you ever work in oil fields there with your father? Well, if I was born in 1904, November 1904, and I came here in March 1913, how old was I? You've been nine years old. I was eight years old. Eight years old. Yeah. Later, I did work in oil fields, but uh, I was eight years old, nine years old, ten years old. We lived at Drumright during the the boom days, 1913-14-15. Tell me what it was like to be a child in the boom days, those times. I try and recall some of those things in order to, uh, uh, because I want to put together a companion for the 46 star this year, and uh, uh, I want to, uh, it would be a compilation of historical pieces that I have written, but supplemented with some others such as what's it like to be a child in the oil fields in the boom days. In those days, roads were almost non-existent. It was a hard day's drive from Cushing to, to Drumline, which is a matter of what, eight or nine, eight or nine miles. You know. uh, my father had, he would go up in Nebraska and Kansas and buy big draft horses. He had big horses, but uh, uh, it was still a hard, hard day's drive. Sometimes you'd have to use two teams uh, and the like. Uh, so we moved to Drumright in April 1913. They, uh, there was a, I was in the third grade and uh, there was a school on the north side of what is now Highway 33, State Highway 33 through Drumright. It, was, it wasn't State Highway 33 then, but it was the main drag uh, through the town. And on, and on the west part of Drumright, it's called Tiger Hill. You go down, I mean, and up, you don't notice it's much in a car now, but you notice it then. And this school was on the north side of, of and it had a, it had a metal roof. <clears throat> when it rained or hailed, you can imagine what a confusion there was in, in that school. Uh, 
I was uh, I was fortunate enough to have a teacher by the name of Lenore Cummings, C U M M I N G S, whose father was a superintendent for an oil company, and she was a very was a very a very fine teacher. Two years later, when I was in the fifth grade, down at the Wheeler School, which was a new school, Wheeler named for the Wheeler number one well for the Frank Wheeler family. Uh, Lenora Cummings was my teacher again. I'm very, very fond of her and I'd like to know what happened to her. Well, at any rate, that summer of, of 1913 was a, there was a beehive of activity. Those were the days of cable tubes. I did an interview once for the Oklahoma Magazine and came out of Cable fuels. Well, hell, it wasn't cable fuels. It was cable tools. I mean, you, you, you were using a, a stem and a bit, and it was suspended by by a cable. And you had a walking beam went up and down, and that's the way you drilled in those days. So you actually drilled by. The walking beam was the like the pump jack going up and down. Yeah, you'd go to the pump jack. Yeah, okay. walk, walking beam, pull it up and down, and so actually, literally, the the bit which was removable from the stem, the stem was twenty five or thirty feet long. It was a solid piece of steel. It had a a joint at the top that you could remove that to you you run. It was about four or five feet to run a cable into that joint and, and solder it in there. And so that, then, then at the at the foot of the stem was a bit. Of course, you're sometimes you were in very hard formations. And, uh, it would batter that batter that that bit uh, periodically. You had to you had to pull the tools out of the hole and change bits. Uh, if you, uh, if the well was not very deep, I mean, if you just started to drill, I had a, I had a blast furnace on the dirt floor where you would, you, you'd have two bits, you know, and I don't mean a quarter, uh, so you pull your tools out of the hole and change bits, put on a fresh one. Run it down. Anytime you take the other, put it in that blast furnace first, and heat it. And uh, then, when it hot, hot enough to be malleable, well, of course, the driller and the tool dresser would would uh, hammer it in, in shape with the uh, with, with sledgehammers. Uh, incidentally, there was this protocol about it. Uh, the driller was was the senior. He he directed things and. Uh, it's like an engineer and a farmer on the train, and the and the uh, tool dresser had to follow suit where the where the driller hit by them he hit or nothing like. So they they could, and that's the reason they call him a tool dresser. I mean, they were dressing that bit for they don't depend on the depend on the formations. Of course, that that Cushing field, that Cushing Grammar field. Got production at anywhere from 2,800 to 3,500 feet. Now, uh, today with a rotary, you could drill that in a couple of days or three days, as, as like. But back in 1913, 14, 15, it was it sometimes take uh, three or four months to, to drill a well. Now, in the oil fields, is the only place that I know where. You pronounce T O U R, which we'd pronounce tour, it is is a tower. So you were running a midnight tower, which meant you went on at midnight and off at noon, or you ran the noon tower, which meant you went on at noon and off off at midnight. Twelve hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and the uh, the elite of the oil fields were the rig millers. Some of them got as much as twenty dollars a day, and that was phenomenal at for that period of time. Uh, but it's also phenomenal the way they could put up a, a derrick. When I came to Oklahoma, came out from Illinois, around, Lawrence, around Robinson, Illinois, Lawrenceville, Illinois, 
wells were around 700 feet deep and they were using six to five foot derricks when I came to Oklahoma. They were using 72 foot derricks and then they went to eight, 84 feet. And then, to, then with the rotaries, they went to 112 feet. And now, of course, with these real deep wells, uh, we've got derricks 175 feet to 175 feet. What the, are they? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The, uh, of course, the uh, uh, everything was uh, operated by steam. We had boiler boilers and new steam boilers, and uh, when you were getting down near the sand where you were expecting to get some gas in production, well, they <clears throat> they'd move uh, uh, the derrick out some distance from the well. Otherwise, why well, your derrick was fairly, fairly close by. Also, the uh, when they're getting down where you're going to get some gas or whatnot, well, they'd have to move the tool resting outfit. That's the reason it didn't take longer. I mean, deeper you got, to take longer, longer to, to do that. But uh, the, the, but the uh, rig miller was, uh, was in a an elite class, and, and uh, as I say, some of them, even in those days, got $20 a day, was and how they built those rigs and, and tapered them and, and kept them uh, plumb, I, I don't know. It, it was remarkable that, that they were able to do it. Today, of course, we assemble rigs you know, that put together uh, by manufactured pieces and the like. So, what wood makes the best derrick? I beg pardon? Which wood did they use? What kind of wood would they use in the, those derricks? I presume it was pine. I don't know if it, it was uh, they were using. Well, as I remember, it was probably two by eights, and uh, and they would use two of them. I mean, they 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 they'd make a leg like that, you know, and it's tapering, but they they would have two two. It didn't depend on just a single one. I mean, after they put there, then they'd slap another another up, up against it and the like. Uh, but uh, the, the, the work in the oil fields was, was, it was seven days a week. Uh, now, my dad got, he eventually had 18 teams, which was one of the biggest team operators in that, in that field. But team, he got eight, he got $6 a day for, for, uh, for a team. And uh, he <clears throat> paid a driver, a Skinner would call him, a dollar and a quarter a day. He did some on it, but it, but it was a seven day. It was a seven day work uh, work week. Kind of thing. Nine, in nineteen sixteen, there was a, a a flurry of activity in south of Drumright, and the town of Shamrock was established about six or seven miles south of, of Drumright, and we moved. My father then sold his teams and became a drilling contractor. But uh, World War I was, uh, waged, was raging in, in Europe, and on April 6, 1917, the United States entered the conflict. And as a new uh, newcomer in the drilling field, he had difficulty getting equipment, so he sold out and we moved to Emporia, Kansas, and we lived in Emporia, Kansas during well, or moving back when we came back, when we located at Newkirk and then Bahuska and then Old Monkey. And uh, I did my last work in the oil fields at Cromwell in the summer of 1924. That's 60 years ago this this, uh, this summer. Uh, when you first came to Oklahoma in 1913, what kind of houses did the oil field workers live in? <laughs> they had what's known as shotgun houses, if they had a house at all. Many of them. In the early days at Drumright, uh, had a floor uh, with uh, with planks up to oh four or five feet, and then then a tent. Especially many of them lived 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 in tents. A shotgun house takes its name from the fact that it's one continuous uh, uh, one room right after another strung strung out. Uh, <clears throat> we had such a house on the north edge of of, of Drumright. Uh, so you, you, uh, you, 
you come in and it's it's and they were made most of them made out of pine. Of course, in those days, we didn't have to go to the corporation commission for relief from gas rates. If there was a gas line within two or three or four hundred feet of your house, well, you'd get a uh, put a saddle on, get a punch, punch a little hole in that gas line, and tap it for for free gas. I I never knew what it was to pay for gas uh, until I got out of college, landed in Oklahoma City. Uh, it was, uh, and of course, it's the amount of waste in that thermite field was criminal. I mean, if they'd only known that the gas they were blowing off was worth much more, more much more than an oil, than the oil. Many people may wonder there was no. Uh, there was no sort of proration, there was no sort of conservation program. And so you would find uh, derricks slapped up against each other and the like. And everybody who, who was drilling produced as fast as he, as he could. I know some people today don't know what a tank form is, but we had tank forms, 55,000 barrel tanks, uh, so that company had flush production, it would run it into those tanks for, for storage. Many people don't know it, but I think you'll find one at the museum in, in Drumright. It would get a little cannon on hands so that tank had a fire, tank caught fire. Of course, you had dikes around, but they'd roll that cannon in place, and fire a couple rounds in that tank at the lower bottom, let the oil out to keep it from boiling over and, and, and spreading. It was, and again, you had, a, you had an elite group that built those tanks. And it was amazing the way they could hoist those uh, sections into place and rib them into place and still make them tight enough uh, that, they, uh, that they wouldn't, wouldn't leak. Uh, and of course, as it became an older uh, an overpopulation. I mean, people got more settled. We saw fewer tents and uh, and more permanent houses, but yeah. permanent in the sense that, as I say, they were shotgun houses built up uh, one room right after another. Um, what did you do in the oil fields when you first started working there? Well, when I first started working, when I last started working, it was saying the number of last summer, 1924 now. I'm 19, I'll be 20 in November. And I had, uh, I finished high school at Oklahoma in 1922, and I had had a hankering to go into the newspaper business. And I hounded, Jerry Rand was managing after the Oklahoma Times, and I hounded Jerry for a job until finally in October 1922, he gave me a job as a proofreader. From that, I mean, after I worked at Young Times or until September 23, then I went to Oklahoma and then college and I literally stumbled into a job in the publications department. And in the meantime, Ed Hadley was head of the publications department. He was enterprising and innovative, and we took the weekly orange and black college newspaper and made a semi weekly and a daily the, the Oak Legion, which it is today. In my Sophomore year, I was then managing editor of the Oak Legion. In my junior year, I was editor, and in my senior year, I was back to the publications department. But, but, but after my freshman year, I, was, I entered in September 1923. After my freshman year, uh, I got a job with the Gypsy as a roustabout at Cronenberg, which was then a, a boom, boom town. The Gypsy had a camp there. It was unusual in that respect. Had a, a camp in the town with a pretty decent boarding house and uh, and a bunk bunkhouse. So I had the advantage of, of, of bunkhouse and, and a good boarding house. And the gypsy had uh, uh, had production on both sides of the east and west street that goes out of out of Brownville. So everything was fairly close close at hand. So I was good. I roused, roused about that summer. That was my last work in the oil fields. When you first started working in the oil fields, when you first started working there, 
Well, I said that was first and last time. Oh, first and last oh, time. I will take that back. After I finished high school in 1922, while I was trying to get a job on the Times, I worked as a helper on a truck over at Bristol. Bristol had a, a, a boom on summer 1922. I worked on it as a, you know, as a helper, and I got a job driving a, a Ford truck down to Costa, Texas, which is near, near Mahaya. Mahaya is M E X I A. I came back to Old Baldwin. That was, uh, that was uh, and I was still after Joe ran for, for a job. Uh, but in the meantime, I was practically supporting my mother and my brother and sister. So I got a job with Pharaoh Construction Company driving a truck on that. Uh, they were paving the road from Old Baldwin to Morris, and I had a job driving, driving a truck until. Matter part of October when I finally got the job on the old Moby Times and started as a proofreader. And of course, I then kept working into doing being a reporter and things like that. So, you said you moved to Pahuska. Well, when we came back from Emporia in January 1919, we landed at Newkirk. My father had bought a lease out east of Newkirk. He drilled a gas well, got a Shallow gas well looked good, and uh, 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 there was a promoter hit down, going to put in a glass plant or something, and uh, looked like there'd be a ready market for the gas. But my dad then drills a second well and hit salt water, and it killed both of them. So uh, we moved to Pahuska in 19, uh, latter part of 19. He was a he was a drilling contractor with uh, J. K. Gano, who had to, who had been a right hand man to C. B. Schaefer. Uh, I had a contract up in the Osage country and got a fishing job and uh, uh, they had been ahead if they skidded the rig and drilled over again, but they didn't, and he went broke there. So then we moved to Milwaukee in the dead of winter, of December nineteen twenty. And uh, uh, Pahuska's always had, a, I've always had a warm spot in my heart for, for Pahuska. But uh, unfortunately for my father, it was a financial disaster. Was your major journalism at a and M? I majored. I majored in English and minored in history and, uh, and economics, as I say. The experience I had on the Oklahoma Times enabled me to, uh, I literally stumbled into a job in the publications department when I met Ed Hadley. And I wrote what we call hometown stories. You know, maybe there'd be uh, eight or ten students uh, accepted for the band, and they came from five or six different towns. Um, we would put out stories to the newspapers or the hometown newspapers and that was what I did. Um, but meantime the uh, the college paper was a weekly the orange and black and uh, uh, Ed Hadley I, he had been with the Associated Press and was a good newspaper man and so he wanted to Get it on a seven weekly basis and a daily basis. And so, uh, in the process, changed the name of it to the Old Legion or the Daily Old Legion. I think, it, I think it's. Why'd you choose that name? Oh, I don't know. We just had a session one Saturday morning and working with, uh, <laughs> with, with different combinations. And uh, somebody had suggested the Oklahoma Legion. But we are going to have a tabloid size, five column paper, and the Oklahoma Legion was too long a name, so we called it cut it down to the Oak Legion. Uh, Old Posse, uh, C O L L E G I A N. That was uh, the. Uh, it was, it just developed from, from a book session one Saturday morning. Who was president of the college at that time? Dr. Bradford Knapp, who later became my father. What kind of man was he? Well, he was the son of Dr. Seaman Ahab, who 
Oh. Was uh, once assistant secretary, uh, assistant secretary of agriculture. He had visited the uh, Orient. He introduced rice culture to southern Louisiana, and he is the founder of the extension service in the county agent system. You mentioned Dr. Seaman ain't up to anybody in the extension service, and they bowed to Mecca about three times. And Dr. Bradford Knapp, his son, had been associated with him. Dr. Seaman ain't died in 1911. Dr. Bradford Knapp had been associated with him in the Department of Agriculture. But after World War I, uh, he uh, took, uh, he was appointed dean of agriculture at the University of Arkansas and moved to Fayetteville. And uh, after the Walton debacle in 1923, uh, effort was moved to stabilize a and College. And so Dr. Bradford Knapp was, was an actual president of a and College and moved to Stillwater. He had, uh, he had three sons and two daughters. An older, older daughter was Mary Knapp, who entered college same time I did. And, 1928, we were married. She's now deceased, but that was just a coincidence that the Knapps got to still water at the same time I did. Yeah. You mentioned the, you mentioned Jack Walton. Yeah. What was that whole mess over that led to his uh, removal? Well, Jack Walton was a, was a charming individual, and I uh, was fortunate enough to know him Personally, uh, when he served on the Corporation Commission, he was elected in, uh, in 1932 for his first six year term, and I knew him personally when he served on the Corporation Commission. Uh, but turning back, he had been mayor of Oklahoma City, and it, it's, it's always been a puzzle to me why Jack Walton uh, followed the course he did. He, he was high-handed and dictatorial. Uh, he had introduced mounted police and the like, and he carried on a running feud with E.K. Gaylord, who was publisher of the Daily Oklahoma, and, and he was going to make Mr. Gaylord move the building back because he insisted the Oklahoma was encroaching on the street about six inches and the like. Uh, he was elected governor in the, in the Backwash of World War One, the turmoil that followed World War One, the labor unrest and the like. The former Labor Reconstruction League up in the Dakotas had uh, had uh, oh, it had spawned I don't know what you would call it uh, innovations, but something that was bordering on radicalism and and some of the some of the workers of the Farmer Labor Reconstruction League were down here to back Walton um, for governor. Now, I got through the regular session of the legislature. The legislature went home. But the Ku Klux Klan was very active in Oklahoma. Now, Walton wasn't a Catholic. His wife wasn't Catholic. And uh, he was waging a, a paper war with the Ku Klux Klan, you know, uh, he was going to uh, disrobe the Klan and the like. Uh, so in October 1923, he made the mistake of calling a special session of the legislature to pass a bill to unmask Ku Klux Klan. When the legislature met, the, the House immediately launched an investigation of Walton and uh, his high-handed tactics and, uh, uh, and voted impeachment charges him and he was uh, impeached and removed uh, by the Senate said this court of impeachment. A technical charge on which he was uh, removed, a technical charge, was putting his chauffeur on the health department to payroll. I mean, it was a very minor charge, but actually uh, his, his removal from office was a result of, uh, of the uh, a dictatorial, high-handed activities of the governor and his uh, followers. He had sent to the, the, the Board of Agriculture Service Regents for the a and College, and he had uh, had the board elect George Wilson uh, president of the a and College in summer of 23, notwithstanding the 
fact that uh, Wilson didn't have a high school education. He, he didn't last long up there. As I say, uh, the, the result was an effort to stabilize the college, restore some stability. Uh, and the board elected Dr. Knapp as president. He took over for a period. He, he was there five years until he went to Auburn as president of uh, Alabama Polytechnic College. But later, I knew, knew Walt Moon and served on the Corporation Commission. It was amazing uh, the uh, appeal he had to people. Now, he's just one, one of three members of the Corporation Commission. But every day, the Corporation Commission had offices on the fourth floor of the Capitol side there. And uh, from early morning, late night, there would be the, a line of people sitting in chairs waiting uh, to see Jack Walton, see what he could do for him, you know, on the way of a job or something like that. Well, of course, he was removed in 1923. And was nine years later, he was like the corporation. He served six years. But even, but even so, in the 1934 campaign, he ran for governor, and uh, uh, E.W. Marlin uh, led the field uh, over Tom Anglin, who was back for Governor Murray, Alfalfa Bill Murray was governor, you know, wasn't back Tom Anglin. But Jack Walton was third in, in, a, in a big field for governor in 1934. Shows you the, the appeal that he had, uh, the hold he had on you said that you almost became lieutenant governor. Well, that was 1954. I was running oh, for, for lieutenant governor. <laughs> Ran for lieutenant governor. Uh, Bill Murray, I mean, uh, Jim Barry was uh, completing his fifth term. Everybody said that it could be Jim Barry. And I said, the heck, you can't. Uh, <clears throat> history of the runoff, you get those old timers into a runoff, and they're dead duck. But I. I, uh, I'd had a number of campaigns. I've spent more money in a ward race for somebody else than I had to spend in a state race. But down to Caddo was one James Pinckney Williams, P-I-N-C-K-N-E-Y Williams, who was known as Pink Williams, who goes into the district court of Caddo, I mean, at Atoka, and uh, added Cowboy to his name. He became Cowboy Pink Williams, and he knows me out of the runoff. True to as I had predicted, Jim Barry went down to defeat it in, in the runoff. That was the history of, of the runoff. How close was the election? Oh, the election was. You mean in the runoff? I'd have to look at state directors yeah, well, to see what the figures yeah, so figures were on it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get some information on Captain Styles. What? Captain Styles. Well, of course you know, um, Mary Jo Nelson of the Times was doing a feature involving the Good Hope home on Northeast Fourth Street, and and that was on the north side of Fourth Street, which was in the Maywood edition, which was the first edition to Oklahoma City after the run of 1889. Uh, Captain Stiles had come in here with uh, four companies of infantry and they were camped on what was known as a military edition. It's east of Walnut and south of 4th Street. As a matter of fact, I discovered uh, that he lived on the north side of 4th Street about uh, the 300 block. Well, nevertheless, uh, of course, uh, Captain Stiles had uh, had joined the Union Army in August of 1861. Uh, President Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers, and he stayed in the Army. Promotions were slow in 1889. He's still uh, a captain, but with years of, of service. But he was law and order in, in, in Oklahoma City at, at that time. And, uh, lots of people don't know it, but <clears throat> But sitting comfortably in a railroad car was General Merritt, uh, Wesley Merritt, who had, uh, had been a major.
major general in the war, and then they were reduced, and I think he was at that time a brigadier general. Uh, actually, uh, he was in charge of the operation, but very few knew it. And, uh, so Stiles uh, continued to, uh, he, <coughs> they had the troops cut logs down in the, in the North Canadian River bottom and build huts and the like. Bill Perman Quarters, well, that came up, up to 1892. That's three years after the war. And he gets orders to take his command over to Fort Reno and, and uh, turn him over, turn the command over to somebody else. Troops moved down to Fort Sill and, and, he was, and he was retired. Now, he participated in the Cherokee outlet uh, a run of September 16th, 1893. I have not researched that, but I, but uh, nevertheless, Mary Jo Nelson was going to feature, and so I had occasion. There was a question about his name. Uh, he was, uh, 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 I was signed as DF style. I thought his name was David, but it was Daniel. I, I came out to run card index and I, and I see a, uh, in one one card incidentally in the newspaper file room are drawers and drawers of uh, index cards. That was a WPA writer's project mm -hmm. and they indexed Oklahoma, Oklahoma newspapers up to 1936. It's, it's a big help for, for research but here is an obscure reference to a pending court martial of Captain Stiles so, and that would take place in November of 1893. So I picked out the, the files and papers for November and nothing in it about it. And, uh, so I, uh, I wrote the Department of Defense of the Army uh, and see what they had on the court martial Captain Stiles. And after weeks, I get a letter from the colonel saying, we don't find anything, but it referred my letters to the National Archives. And more weeks go by and I don't hear anything. So I write the National Archives and I get a letter in time from a fellow saying, we don't find anything. But in the same mail was a letter from a woman in the old Army and Navy records section of where she had found a record of the court martial of Captain Stiles. Now, uh, he has already, he's already retired, but they pulled him up for a general court martial, colonel and six other officers. It was, a, and they brought a shorthand reporter down from Kansas City to report that uh, uh, trial. And the offense that, uh, that uh, Captain Stiles was charged with uh, uh, with favoritism and dismantling the military. Uh, quarters and putting those buildings up for sale. Well, he had, there were two or three papers operating in town. He didn't have money to advertise, but he had visited the town you know, with the sale. And uh, Henry Overholzer was one of the big wheels in Oklahoma City those days. So uh, it looks over that section and uh, talked to some of his cronies and, and they show up for the auction and he says, well, that would be an ideal place for a fairgrounds. So don't bid on it, don't bid on it, don't bid on it. And so uh, in the auction, the bids fell through, and finally, uh, Henry Overholzer and others bought billings for $395 or something like that. Uh, a, uh, a, a sergeant, not, not part of Captain Stiles' command, had been sent in here to conduct the auction, and he was a uh, uh, he was an alcoholic, uh, and Stiles got so annoyed with him that he sent a couple of soldiers with him to see if he got on the train. At that time, there was a midnight train out of here, but that sergeant blew the whistle on him, and on that basis, Stiles was uh, was brought to trial. And uh, uh, <coughs> I uh, this this woman wrote that. That uh, I could have a microphone film record of it for $155. So I talked my 
friend of Jacques Pontius, asked at that time to see if the historical society would buy it, and they wouldn't. And so I thought it myself, I've got that record seven days, so I'm going to talk to Earl about it, and I'll be giving it to the society. But I get 62 feet of microfilm, and lo and behold, the, uh, they were using typewriters in those days, so the record was typed, and I had to take it up to the newspaper file room, put it in the reader, and like, and you'd find the story of the, uh, the incredible court martial Captain Stiles is one of the stories that I've done, it's a, it's a, and it's one that I will have uh, in, in the new book. He was acquitted, and the Secretary of the Secretary of War, Assistant Secretary of War, reviewing the record, was quite caustic, saying this officer should never have been brought to trial when they shouldn't have been brought to trial, as a matter of fact. But he died in September of 1900. His widow went to California. She died in 1936. I had to, she buried out in Fairview, so was he. I had to, a friend of mine, President of Fairview Cemetery Association, I had to get him run the records, see when Mrs. Stiles was buried. It's an interesting story, and, a, and it brings up a point with the historical society. I don't know why they don't pay attention to stories that have been researched. Now, if you would look in vain for anything on the court-martial Captain Stiles, and, and I personally paid $155 for that record, uh, which the historical society should have. As I say, I've intended to talk to her about giving it to him sometime on her plot. But it's one of those interesting stories in which uh, contemporary writers, I don't know why they didn't make any mention of it, you know. Uh, I, I thought, you know, that papers would send somebody to Reno, uh, uh, El Reno to cover the trial. They, they didn't. Of course, you know, hell, they were operating on a shoestring and the like. But you would think that they would have had some coverage of the I report Marshal Captain Stiles. Yeah. He was sent here um, in 89. Yeah, he was sent in here before the run. Of Why was he sent here? To keep, to keep order. Was he sent here before the run? Oh, right? yeah. He was in here two or three days before the run. Okay, was he, did he have any responsibility in keeping the sinners out? No, apparently not. Uh, but he did have. Uh, Responsibility maintaining order. And Charlie Calcord was the first chief of police. And, and Charlie Calcord uh, and the captain worked hand in hand. As a matter of fact, Calcord used the military stockade for some of the first arrests that were made. You know, and, and, uh, an opening like that of April 22, 1889, attracted all sorts of charlatans, gamblers, uh, the, uh, well, not necessarily bootleggers, you could, uh, but but there were there were all sorts of gym joints still were down and and the like, and so Styles was primarily to keep law and order. There was a there was a well. You, you see, this was Oklahoma Station. And the Choctaw Railroad was building through here, east and west, and so it was centrally located, and uh, and uh, it was more attractive uh, than Guthrie. I mean, it was obvious uh, that Oklahoma Station was uh, that the community built around Oklahoma Station was going to be uh, the leading city of the, of the territory. See, uh, and here's a, a well down there. Some. <laughs> Some entrepreneur uh, takes over the well and he's selling water, you know, five cents a cup and things like that, until somebody reports to Captain Stiles and he, he boots him out of there. And, you know, I mean, there were things of that nature that were going on. And Stiles, as I say, he was law, law and order in this community. What about the Seminoles and the, the Kickapoo land companies? Well, it's, it was a little bit difficult, and I never did go into to their operations. I mean, two land companies are here, you know, and there were two different plats, and one was north and south, and one was parallel to Santa Fe, and they didn't quite jive, and that was the reason we had a jog in Robinson and the like. Uh, 
but to get into you know, to get into that struggle of the uh, kick, of, of kick boos and stuff uh, takes a little more research than I. I didn't go that far back. I mean, when I wrote the Forty Six Star, it began with um, June the fourteenth, nineteen oh six, when Congress passed the Enabling Act for a constitutional convention. Uh, there, in 1942, the Times Journal published a volume called Tales of the 89ers. If you don't have a copy of it, uh, it's, uh, it ought to be in the Historical Society. Unfortunately, I have a copy of it. And there are countless personal stories of, of people who were, uh, when I got out of college in 1927 and joined the Times, June 6, 1927. That was only 38 years after, after the run. And many 89ers, like Bill Pettit, uh, Pettit Hardware, uh, many 89ers are still in business and still active. And, and even in 1942, the Times Journal got, and you get the stories of the Seminoles and the, and the Kickapoos, but they were rival land companies. And of course, there were. <laughs> All sorts of claims to be uh, claims to be adjusted. Uh, uh, Dr. A. C. Scott was uh, a very well-educated, erudite uh, gentleman who had a good voice that carried, and he he was uh, instrumental in calling mass meetings, and they set up a, a system for determining the uh, for settling uh, lot disputes where you know there were rivals for the. I, I was privileged to know Dr. Scott personally. Instantly, uh, he had served territorial days as president of the AM College under the Republican administration. But uh, they, uh, uh, they nailed three, uh, three small planks together to form a triangle, and uh, the committee that was adjudicating the lot disputes uh, stayed in that. You know, they just moved that along. That was to keep the people from crowding around them as they moved from one dispute to another just to, to, to settle those claims. I asked Dr. Scott one time, uh, where is Booty alive? I presume that, you know, there'd been a number of fatal shootings. And he said, well, we didn't have one. Instead, he's buried out the buried. But, <clears throat> but the, one, uh, the one shooting was kept at the couch, you know. He was provisional mayor of Oklahoma City in a, in a dispute over a claim there at the Walker and Main Street where the old courthouse is. Of course, you wouldn't know that was the old courthouse had been there. Uh, he was he was shot fatally wounded there at, uh, at Walker and uh, Punch Down Walker and, uh, and, and Main Street. Uh, of course, Captain Couch had been a, a right-hand man to David Payne of the Boomers. Of course, Payne died several years before the run of 1889, he had led numerous uh, parties into who tried to uh, open up this, these so-called unassigned lands. He didn't live to see it, but the couch, the couch did. Uh, the thing that people don't understand, I make lots of after-dinner talks, and I usually begin with April 22nd, 1889, bring the party. Many Oklahomans think that on April 22nd, 1889, that the, the home seekers lined the Kansas border and the Arkansas border and the Texas border and the Texas Panhandle border and rushed in there and opened the settled in the entire state. Well, if you look at the map, you find that the, what they settled was six central counties, the so called unassigned, unassigned lands. But Congress then, as now, was very haphazard, very careless. Matter of fact, the opening resulted from a rider tacked on the Union Appropriation Bill in March of 1889 when Grover Cleveland was completing his first term as president. Presidents were inaugurated in those days on March the 4th. And so Cleveland was faced with the dilemma of if he vetoed the Indian Appropriation Bill to kill that rider, uh, the Indian Appropriations would be killed. If he approved it, well, the rider would open down the side land, so he approved the bill. And, and, 
Benjamin Harrison became president the next next day, and it was up to him to issue the proclamation. So he became president on March 4th, 1889, and, and shortly thereafter he issued the proclamation for the run of April 22nd, 1889. But the Congress had made no provision for, for government. They just opened up to the unassigned lands. So it was necessary for the people who came in here, these early settlers, they had to have some form of government, so they set up a provisional government. And that's uh, and that's the way Couch was elected as as mayor. They would call him the first mayor, but he was a provisional mayor. And it wasn't until May of 1890 that the Congress passed the Organic Act, which provided for a form of government. And then that applied to Oklahoma Territory, um, which uh, was still relatively small. That's May 1890. And, we don't open the Cheyenne and the Arapaho country till 1891. We don't open the Cherokee outlet till 1893. And, uh, uh, but uh, under, under that uh, organic act, of course, the president appointed territorial governor and other territorial officials, and the people elected uh, a legislature. And so the, uh, the uh, first legislature met in Guthrie there. In August of 1890. Now, if you if you take a look at at a map, we'll see one here. What are those six counties? Well, there's Payne County, Logan County, Oklahoma County, Cleveland County, Canadian County, and Kingfisher. And so, already there's a move on foot. Uh, and. Guthrie was the territorial capital, but already there's a move on foot to move the capital to Oklahoma City. So in that first legislature, uh, efforts are made to uh, <clears throat> to move the capital from Guthrie to Oklahoma City. And uh, there were, in the council, which was, we call it the state senate now, but the council had 13 members, six Democrats, six Republicans, uh, one uh, uh, populist, George W. Gardenhauer from Stillwater. The uh, Rep Republicans from Oklahoma County were more interested in getting capital than they were in organizing, so they, through their support, uh, got their support for Gardenhauer, and he was elected president pro, pro temporary uh, of the <coughs> council. There was a populist who was speaker, there were 26 members of the House. But Council Bill Number Seven would have moved the capital from Guthrie to Oklahoma City. But in the long run, and I point this out to one of the audience, say, "Man, how did Oklahoma and M College go to Stillwater?" Well, George W. Gardenhauer got it as a reward. For and how did the Normal School go to Edmond as part of? And how did the University go to Cleveland County was part of the long run process of moving the capital. George W. Steele, the first governor, vetoed the bill. And, uh, and subsequently, Bird McGuire was, well, Dennis Flynn was territorial delegate to Congress. Um, at that time, Flynn was, uh, he'd been in the land office in Guthrie. Uh, Congress in, incorporated in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the territorial appropriation bill proviso that the government capital should remain in Guthrie. Then, then we come up to, uh, Bert McGuire was in Congress, we come up to passage of the Enabling Act, which provided for a constitutional convention, right, constitution for the proposed state of Oklahoma, and Bert McGuire writes into that Enabling Act to provide so that capital remain in Guthrie until 1913. Of course, when Charlie Haskell became governor, Frank Greer, who had the state capital newspaper, uh, was uh, <laughs> was a very partisan Republican, and he was uh, riding Haskell pretty high. So when uh, uh, Mr. Gaylord, who was active in the Chamber of Commerce, and headed a committee that initiated the to move the capital, uh, when Haskell got a chance, but then. He, he called an election on that initiated petition for June 11, 1910, uh, to move the capital. And uh, that happened to be a Saturday. 
people didn't notice it. I, I met C.M. Haskell, Bob Belmar, I was governor. Murray had been president of the Constitutional Convention. Haskell had been a big wheel of the Constitutional Convention, and we hit it off uh, very well. I didn't notice, although I was doing research for the 46 star, that he had switched that election from June the 14th, which was Tuesday, to Saturday, June the 11th, because he knew what was going to happen. And he was determined to, uh, that as soon as people voted to move the capital, they were going to move it. Oklahoma City had, cap had campaigned on a theory that even though people voted for it, they wouldn't get the capital until 1913. But Haskell had different ideas. What kind of man was Governor Haskell? What was he like? He was a very resourceful individual and a very audacious individual. Uh, uh, he'd been a railroad promoter up in Ohio. Of course, railroad promoters uh, were about equal to to land pirates, they were, uh, they were, they were not the most uh, ethical operators. Uh, he knew how to make a fast buck, and he knew how others make a fast buck. So he, uh, uh, he eventually was affluent enough that he had a private railroad car, and he'd take his family out down to San Antonio for the winter. On one of those trips, he stopped off in Muskogee and the commercial club entertaining. This was 1901. And he decided that he'd cast his lot with this new, new country. So, one of the first railroads he promoted then was from Leadville uh, to Muskogee. And he built a fine home, which is there on the west side of Leadville. His daughter, Frances, who died a few years ago, was mm -hmm. a very close friend of mine. Uh, she had pointed out various features of that, that home, including the fact that it had glass windows with the floor to leave, but the floor to leave upside down on the thing. Yeah. But Haskell, uh, Haskell promoted the railroad and eventually moved to Muskogee, and uh, he prevailed on, the, on the, the leaders of the five civilized tribes uh, still uh, counted on having a state of their own. They had been promised, the Indians had been promised a state in the removal from the southeastern part of the United States. Now, I think Haskell knew that there wasn't going to be a, a, an Indian state, but the best way to let them find out was to try it. So uh, he had enough uh, prestige that he could uh, prevail on them. Pleasant Porter, who was principal chief of the Creeks, called a convention called the Sequoia Convention, which met in Muskogee in 1905 and drafted a, a constitution for the proposed state of Sequoia. Among those delegates, of course, was young William H. Murray from down in Tishomingo, who had married a niece of the governor of the, of the Chickasaws, and, and uh, Bob Williams from down in Durant, and others. And drafted the Constitution for the Sequoia Convention and it was submitted to a vote of the people and, uh, of the Indian Territory and approved and a delegation went to Washington to see President Theodore Roosevelt who, who told them, you know, uh, we're not going to have two states down there but one, and, but going back we'll do something about it. So the Sequoia Convention and the efforts to get statehood for, for a separate state uh, prompted the Roosevelt administration and the Congress to pass the Enabling Act of 1906, which then provided for a constitutional convention, write a constitution for the state of Oklahoma, and thus pave the way for the two territories to come in as one state. What were they against the two-state idea? Well, in the first place, uh, in the first place, uh, it would have meant four Democrats to the United States Senate, as it was, as it was, uh, we sent two Democrats up there. That was one thing. For another thing, 
they would have been small states and they would have been uh, uh, they would have been uneconomic. It was it was much better that the two were united in, in one small state. Yeah. What kind of man was Dr. Scott, Angelo Scott? Well, he was I think the word is ascetic. He was tall, uh, had a voice that carried well, wore battling collars, and he was uh, a, a well-educated man. In fact, he organized the men's dinner club and was president of it for years, and he, he was a leader in the social affairs. Of, of, as I say, he served in, during a Republican territorial administration. He served as president of the local man at college of, of Matt Stillwater. He was a uh, he was a fine gentleman. Um, you started working for the newspaper in 1927? Yeah. What were your duties then, 1927? That's uh, kind of summer I covered general assignments, federal building for a while, the approaching visit of Charles Lindbergh, who came in on September. And I went to the police room, and I was at the police room on, uh, for several months. In the spring of 1928, I went to the courthouse, and I covered the courthouse for a couple of years. And uh, then I, I reached the Capitol in 1929 after the impeachment removal of Henry Johnson and Bill Holloway was governor. But I was uh, at the Capitol in a short time before I went in as a uh, Assistant city editor for 18 months. And during that time, of course, Bill Murray was elected. In Governor in November 1930. I, I continued to serve as assistant city editor until Lee Hills. Who was covering Capitol for us was hired by the Scripps Hired Paper, the Oklahoma News, and I came back to the, back to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. Why was Henry Johnson removed? Well, the specific grounds was incompetence. Uh, I was discussing that one time with my friend W. D. Little, who was publisher of Avon News and been active in state politics, and he laughed and said. Well, old Henry wasn't any more competent when they impeached him than it was when they elected him, which was true. Uh, he was a kind gentleman, gentle man, <laughs> but unable to cope with the duties, duties of the governor. After I wrote the 46 Star, which restored him to a uh, place of some prestige, because he had been very active in the Constitutional Convention and have been president pro temporary of the, of the State Senate first session after that. Uh, after I wrote the 46 Star, the old man used to come down frequently from Perry and uh, show up at my office unannounced waiting for lunch and the like, and so I came to North Carolina, but back to the impeachment. Back to uh, Henry Johnson was a political accident. Amy Trapp, who had been elected lieutenant governor, became governor after Walton's impeachment and removal in October 1923. The Constitution provided that a governor could not immediately succeed himself. So Trapp always signed his papers as acting governor and would come up to 1926 and he had announced he was going to run for governor. The trap was very popular and, and he would have had a, an easy race. But, but the only opposite, the opposition he drew was old Henry Johnson from up at Perry, Wild Bill Darnell from out in the Pan Island, and O.A. Cargill, who had been mayor of Oklahoma City. The filing period closed and a suit was filed to strike 
tribe's name from the ballot. And the state Supreme Court upheld that contention. The tribe was removed from the ballot. And thus, uh, the field was reduced to four second-rate second campaigners, you might say. And Henry Johnson happened to win the nomination and the election. But he had a woman's secretary, Mrs. O. O. Hammonds from Opalke, who was very high-handed. She practically took over and ran the governor's office. And she irritated legislators and others by refusing to let them see the governor and the like. And although Henry Johnson got through the regular session of the legislature in 1927, uh, Mrs. Hammond said of so many people that they were ready to, uh, to remove him then, but he didn't make the same mistake that Walton did. He didn't call a special session of the legislature, which would have opened it up to impeachment. But the legislature did attempt to convene itself, and that was the famous Ulam Rebellion. And the Ulam referred to Mrs. Hammonds. Henry Johnson had referred to Mrs. Hammonds once as the U.M., and so that abortive session of legislature was known as the U.M. Rebellion. But, uh, <clears throat> but the Supreme Court held that that measure permitting legislature to be itself uh, was, uh, was void, and therefore the, uh, the attempted session went down the drain. 1929, when legislators just met every other year, when the legislators came back in 1929, they promptly <coughs> launched an investigation, sent the charges over to the Senate. The Senate suspended uh, Governor Johnson and William J. Holloway, who was lieutenant governor, became acting governor, and, uh, and then in the impeachment trial, when well, Johnson was was removed from office, and, and thus Holloway became governor. Hmm. Who do you think is the best governor while you were covering the Capitol? Well, I used to make a talk of Oklahoma's governors, and, uh, and I would tell stories about them. Uh, having met C.N. Haskell, I said I'd be pretty smart to cultivate the former governors. There were six of them at that time, all living with the result that I'm one of the few individuals who's known every governor since statehood. <clears throat> For his time, C.N. Haskell was, was, was the best governor. He was audacious, he was, he was innovative and the like. Uh, for his time, Amy Trapp, who brought uh, stability and, uh, and balance to the governor's office after the removal of Walt uh, was good. For his turn during the hard, hard depression days, uh, William H. Murray was, was, a, was, a, was a good governor. Uh, each fit in a, 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 certain, a certain niche uh, in, in succeeding years. Uh, Robert S. Kerr, who was the first native born governor of Oklahoma. He was governor during the war years of 19, of, uh, elected 42. He was governor from January 43 to 47. Uh, and for his, for his time, Roy J. Turner was, uh, was a good governor. To pick the outstanding governor would be difficult because the, uh, the needs of the times varied uh, uh, during years of years of, of, of statehood. It's rather ironic that one of the weakest governors would be the first one uh, elected for a second term after we amended the Constitution to permit a governor to succeed himself. And that is the guy who's got his picture up there on the wall. How come he's a weak governor? Well, if he hadn't been a weak governor, we wouldn't be in the financial mess that we were in. I mean, you know, he, he had the world by the tail with a downhill drag. I mean, we had the, uh, or 
apparel industry was booming, the revenues were booming, and so <clears throat> the legislature was spending money like a drunken sailor, and, uh, and he went along for the ride. But now in his second term, well, he, he finds we have to pay the fiddler, I mean, of, of, for that. But he's a decent guy, uh, all right, but not a, I would say, not a strong governor. Strong governor would would have put some brakes on the legislature when they were when they were uh, spending money like drunken sailors. What about William H. Murray and the bridge incident? Of course, Bill Murray loved the line. That was one thing, and for another, he had a world of information. I mean, he knew that the, that the Oklahoma, south border of Oklahoma was not the middle of Red River, it was the south, south edge of Red River. And here was a situation, incidentally, there was a good article in, in the Chronicles about the toll bridges, but here was a situation with a toll bridge between Oklahoma and Texas, between Durant and Denison. But the two states, Oklahoma and Texas, build a free bridge. And when they got ready to open the free bridge traffic, the owners of the toll bridge went in the district court at Muskogee, where Bob Williams was a federal judge, to get an injunction. <clears throat> well, now, Williams and Murray had served the Constitutional Convention, and uh, they <laughs> they were uh, they were two of two of different kind at that time they didn't get along the constitutional convention and, and there was no law love lost between them Murray knew that that the south bank of Red River was uh, the, was the south boundary of Oklahoma so it gives him an opportunity to enjoy the limelight with reference to Bob Williams and the injunction, he said, you know, I mean, when he was threatened with contempt, he said, I can't be in any more contempt to the court than the court is in contempt to me. And so he took the National Guard and opened the bridge, and of course, popular sentiment was with him. It was, it was silly to think that you, uh, that you spend millions of dollars to build a free bridge and not be able to use it because the owners of a, of a parallel toll bridge had enjoined the public from using it, so uh, it gave him an opportunity to to enjoy the limelight and, and this effective way of opening the bridge. Did they try to impeach him for that? No, they didn't try to impeach him. Was there a move to, uh, to ever impeach Murray? No, no, but, but he had a vivid recollection of what had happened Walton and to Henry S. Johnson, and one of his favorite expressions was uh, uh, he branded certain members of the legislature as impeachocrats. You know? The irony of it is <clears throat> that one of the impeachocrats in the, in the Johnson, and I have no end, in the Walton, too, was Tom England from Holdenville, who had served in, this, in the Senate. Bill Murray prevailed on England to run for the House in 1932 and serve as Speaker. So Tom Anglin was Speaker of the House of Representatives in 1933. That was, a, that was a deep year of the Depression. That was a very conscientious legislature. And uh, I, uh, I'm a great admirer of Tom Anglin. I think uh, he was the most capable man who ever ran for governor. But uh, he ran for governor in 1934 with Bill Murray's backing. But by 1934, Bill Murray had offended so many people with his idiosyncrasies and what, that his endorsement was practically fatal. So here's E.W. Marlin up in Ponca City who had uh, made and lost a couple of fortunes in the oil business. Marlin ran for Congress in 1932 and uh, Roosevelt's coattail was elected to Congress in 1934. He runs for governor on a slogan to bring the New Deal to Oklahoma. 
and uh, in the primary he ran 55,000 votes ahead of England and third place was Jack Walton. There were three or four other candidates. But England surveyed the situation and decided to withdraw from the runoff and that gave Marlin the, the nomination with or without a runoff. Uh, and England would have been one of the most capable governors. He knew, he knew government and he knew in, in the business. He, he later came back and served as, as president pro temporary of the Senate again. I mean, he, he later served in, in, in the Senate. But one, one, of, one of the most capable. Emmy Trapp was, uh, was, an out, was an outstanding governor. And as I say, he brought stability to Oklahoma after the war. I thought he didn't run for governor again, right? Well, he did, 1930. But there was a span of four years. In 1926, he would have, he could have picked it up easily. Uh, in 1930, times are changed. Bill Murray has come back from Bolivia. Uh, times are hard. Uh, and uh, he catches public fancy. Frank Buttram, the old man, Spent a fortune, of course, got in the runoff with with Murray, and then lost lost in the runoff. Uh, but uh, Trap in nineteen twenty six would have would have won hands hands down. In nineteen thirty, uh, the opportunity slipped through his grasp. I'd say now. What about that South American colony? Well, of course, that's. A, that's a story in itself, it's long. Uh, uh, there's a, a good biography of Bill Murray out called Alfalfa Bill, uh, written by, uh, I knew him well, trying to think, think of his name. Uh, he tells that story. Uh, of course, one of the things was he went to Bolivia to establish the colony. Of course, you know what the political situation is in South America. <coughs> and the, uh, the uh, ne'er-do-well, the, you know, uh, the hard luck people who, who went down there with the colony, they got discouraged and disillusioned and uh, they drifted back uh, to, uh, to the United States. Bill Murray, of course, came back uh, broke and, and uh, it was a fiasco uh, actually but but uh, uh, I'm trying I'm trying to think I, I knew the uh, uh, it was the uh, alpha alpha bill biography was written after Murray's election as governor uh, and you would think it was a it was a vanity book. Actually, it's very well done and tells a story. I, of course, I wasn't connected with the time uh, when Bill Murray was governor. Of course, our papers, the Oklahoma Times, had opposed the election, and he was in the early months. He was very hostile. Was so was covering capital for the Oklahoma Times, covering for the Times, and he was very hostile uh, to the Oklahoma. Times. But as months went by, he began to mellow. And the old man always kept a little tin of, of South American tea called Herve Mate in his, in his desk. And uh, uh, on occasion, he would send down the cafeteria and get a pot of hot water and stir up a, a round of Herve Mate for the newspaper reporters in his office. And, and he would lecture about certain phases of South America or certain phases of the Constitutional Convention or uh, Bill Murray was, a, he was a, an expert on any subject that he chose to discuss. At least, at least he thought he was. And, uh, so, um, but I don't have a connected story of the uh, South America. Yeah. Uh, which governor called out the National Guard to close down the oil fields? Well, that's Bill Murray. That was the governor. Yeah. How come he did that? Well, the price of oil dropped to as low as 10 cents a barrel. 
the state had a definite financial interest in it because of the gross production tax. And it was very wasteful. So he called out the National Guard as an effective way of shutting down the oil fields until the price of oil had uh, reached at least a dollar a barrel. Now again, Bill Murray shows uh, his acumen because he proclaimed martial law in a circle with a radius of 100 feet around each of those wells. Why? So that he didn't suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Lots of people don't understand that. Oftentimes, I, I tell people I'm a graduate of Bill Murray School of Constitutional Law, and I tell it as a joke for someone. But the truth of the matter is that I, I came to appreciate his lectures on the Constitution, and I began to study it with the result that I am a graduate of his school of constitutional law. And I would recommend it to members of the legislature and the governor that they read it at least once every two years or so on. They wouldn't get some of the messes they, they, they do if they read and knew the Constitution. But by proclaiming martial law radius of 100 feet around each well, he, he didn't suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Of course, if you got within that radius and started producing, well, you might get <clears throat> get jabbed with bayonet or like So <clears throat> the oil producers were, were <clears throat> they didn't say so publicly, but they were rather appreciative of Bill Murray's efforts to shut down production until the price got back up. Of course, we had the East Texas field, which was running wild, you know, when the petroleum market was flooded. Uh, there was a socialist movement back in the 20s or 30s. Well, Bill Murray was elected in 1930, and, uh, and this was a, I'm trying to think whether it was 31 or 33. Uh, I, I think it was 1931, yeah, that, uh, that, uh, that he uh, proclaimed Marshall. Marshall Law, oh, yeah. But, yeah. When was uh, Mr. Was it Mr. Ameringer, who was a socialist? Yeah. When was he in the well, limelight? That uh, Oscar Ameringer was a long-haired, uh, picturesque uh, radical of his day. You know, thought of as a radical. Uh, uh, the socialist in Oklahoma hit an all high all time high water mark in nineteen fourteen. If you look at the Oklahoma uh, directory, and I don't see one, but you ought to have one. The election board publishes that every two years that came. Uh, we have one downstairs. The socialist uh, they polled about fifty two thousand votes, as I recall, in the nineteen fourteen election. And they needed a vehicle uh, publication. And so uh, Oscar Ameringer and Dan Hogan uh, started the leader press. And, uh, and, uh, and then Oscar Ameringer married uh, Dan Hogan's daughter, Frida, who, who inherited both from her husband and her father and became you know, uh, control of the control the leader press, incidentally, Bill Murray published his Blue Valley Farmer there at the, uh, on the, on the leader press. Uh, you'd have to, I didn't know Oscar Ameringer personally, I may have met him once or twice, but uh, uh, he, he has a book or two to his credit, incidentally, Frida is still living, of course, and, and uh, Dan Hogan uh, the second. Is uh, of course it has a journal record, and then that journal record building. I mean, uh, he's uh, a far cry from the uh, uh, from the uh, uh, political uh, rabble risers. Uh, rabble risers, not the right, right word, but he's a, 
he's a very, very practical businessman, and, and of course, the, the Socialist Party, you know, uh, finally dissolved, and, and the, uh, the Hogan family controlled the legal press. But Oscar Emmer, I think he was more interested in, in the dogma of socialism and like uh, frequently those <clears throat> those people are not very practical. They 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 uh, are free thinkers and things of that nature, but but they're not very practical when it comes to running a business or running a government or anything of that nature. And that was Oscar Emmer, a delightful gentleman, I'm sure. And, and, and he, as I say, he published a couple of couple of books, but I uh, I can't say that I knew him. Does his wife still have many of his manuscripts? I don't know whether she does or not. Frida's up in years now. I know her. I knew her well, but I haven't seen her in, in a long time. I don't know whether she has or not. Would be rather yeah. interesting to know. Her. You know, we're of the historical society was started by the newspaper people, the Kingfisher, yeah. eighteen ninety three. Yeah. And we were wondering if it'd be a good idea to start collecting the papers of newspaper men for the society. Well, the society did that back in the, this building was built while Bill Holloway was governor in 1929. And the society paid $5,000, which was an outstanding, I mean, uh, uh, for uh, the Bard collection. It's B A R D E. Fred S. Bard was a Kansas City Star correspondent in here in the territory days, and that is the one collection. Few newspaper people uh, have a collection of papers. You know, I see sometimes a reporter, uh, the subpoena reporter, uh, with his with his notes. Well, hell, I didn't keep any notes after I, I dictated the story. I, I covered the Capitol. I'd go by the office at 7.30 in the morning, write my first edition copy, go to Capitol, and I cleared everything by telephone dictation. I, I, I don't think you would gain much uh, from it. Now, when I move into something, like the, the Captain Stiles uh, impeachment, when I move into something, I do a thorough job of research. It's like the brand of Airways, so the new brand of Airways starting service tomorrow. And I had dinner with Mary Jo Nelson, her sister, Monday night. And Mary Jo had done that interview with Mrs. Paul Brownoff, who's now 86 years old. Well, back in June, uh, the first <coughs> first flight of brand of Airways was June the 20th, 1928. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have the assignment on the first flight, but K.J. Dooley was the pilot on that flight. They were using a five-place, I mean, five-passenger plane. I rode with Paul Brandoff on the, on the second flight. Uh, we went all the way to Tulsa, Tulsa and, and back. Uh, and uh, I noticed Mary Jo was doing a story. She's taking John Paul Brandoff uh, on his flight to, to Dallas more and says, you know, that quotes him as saying you couldn't put on 747 all the people uh, who made that first flight. Well, all you have to do is go to the damn file room in the newspaper file room and, and quote, uh, I, to refresh my memory, I, I did that. And I can tell you who was on that, on that flight. Who was Vic, on the flight? Well, Victor Barnett, who was managing head to the Tulsa Tribune, his son, uh, Steele, a reporter on the Oklahoma by the name of Bland Barker, and I have no way of recollection of him. He got the byline on it. Uh, Bill Whip of the Oklahoma News, and uh, and one and one other. But uh, but K.J. Dooley was 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 the pilot on that on that first flight. Paul piloted the second flight. They run two flights a day to Tulsa, and I I rode with. Paul, I rode in the co-pilot seat and they had room for five, yeah. five passengers. Are you familiar with the Harn collection? Well, of course, Jane Harn. I was trying to call Jane for lunch uh, today. I couldn't get her use her phone line for the books she's doing. Uh, I don't know what you mean by the Harn collection. Well, the collection we have here of the 
on papers. No, it didn't. No, you didn't. No, you had them. On yeah. That. Florence Wilson was a dear friend of mine. Jane Horn is. Uh, she's she's Jane McCarty is a very good friend. I don't think she's even aware of it. Uh, <clears throat> Horn was a uh, was a Republican. Came down from Ohio in 1891. Bought a relinquishment, you know, and the relinquishment he bought happened to be this 160 acres. And many of these people who came in here to state claims in 1889 got discouraged. And they they want to sell out, and you could buy it for for songs. So I didn't know you had uh, had a collection. Of them. What sort of papers are they? It's mainly uh, the perjury trials for the senators. Oh, is that so? Yeah. Well, now I did a, a J.B. Thoburn has a footnote on one of his volumes uh, about the only sooner who was honest enough to admit it is Emil Brock, <laughs> and it was it, and it's just an agate type footnote. But when I reached the capital, Gertrude Brock was a draftswoman in the highway department. She she did the first state highway map in 1925. Everything was in the capital. When I reached the capital, everything was in the capital. This building was built in 29. Was, uh, Emil Brock, as a young man, came out from Kentucky, had a job at Oklahoma Station. So here came this run of April 22nd, 1889. And, well, <clears throat> I'm sure he walked up to Santa Fe, mile and a half, two miles, however far it is, Lay down the you know, drain. I tell people he was there by the Dolores restaurant waiting to get a hamburger. And noon came, and he ran up the hill and staked a claim. So he was challenged. And when he came on to to uh, testify, well, I say, "Where were you, Mr. Brock, at noon on April 22, 1889?" And I'm a gentleman from Kentucky, and I cannot tell a lie. I was up there on that drain, so they took his claim away from him. He went out a mile east and bought a relinquishment. And he became one of the town's leading citizens. And he was uh, helped organize this, the Oklahoma State Fair. And he was a cowboy, but he died in 1922. But then the horn play came north in 1936. And what the hell happened? Well, I'd messed up Mrs. Brock's land, something terrible. So with all that oil revenue, Gertrude quit her job. And Mrs. Brock moved that big house up to Northeast 71st Street, you can find it, and there she lived the rest of her life. But that is the one, I, but I didn't know that uh, Horn had, uh, that's it, that's it. So where do you keep those papers? It's in the archives. Is that so? Yeah. Well, that's rather interesting. Um, okay, well, thank you. Let me go ahead. Yeah, go ahead with what you were saying. Okay. I was doing research for the 46 Dar. I had allotted myself January and February 1957 to do it. January, I mean November, would be celebrating 50th anniversary, and I had, I had the advantage of knowing personally these characters that are in here, and so I, I got to work from the original, original papers. They were just starting to micro, microfilm at uh, that time, and I have kicked myself. I have kicked myself. I don't know why. I mean, Mel Phillips was sort of some super like. I don't know why I didn't say the milk when you get That just kills me to find out that uh, that was those this. But I went up to Guthrie and I looked up the widow of an early day photographer. Mr. Hurst, I wish you'd seen me earlier. Why? I had those glass plates hauled up to the city dump. And you know, God damn, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just terrible. But, uh, but it, it's terrible. I had the advantage of working. It's so much easier to work from the found volumes than it is from microfilm, you know. Mm -hmm. I had the advantage of, of, of those, of those, Right. The special election in June of yeah. 1910. Well, as I told you, I had met Governor Haskell two 
Del Mar. Uh, and uh, we hit it off well from the, from the start. So in November 1932, 25th anniversary state of it, uh, I'm doing a series for the Little Tennessee Times. And I dropped an email to this little from the hotel in West Kentucky and asked him, asked him if he would, if they be sore, you need a captain. I had two letters in his handwriting, some in it, dear Hearst, I'll do it. And um, dear Hearst, I, I have done it. So we published that in 1932. <clears throat> I had that to go by. But now I do the I do the research. And in the process, I do research like a lawyer prepares a case. The record is the best. So I, I know my way around. I go to the Secretary of State's office and I pull these documents, including that proclamation for the special election. The proclamation had been prepared in the Attorney General's office in March. And they sent it to the governor and they called for the election on Tuesday, June the 14th. That's when they told me to go up there in Texas they go with the Senate. Now, if he had sent it back and had it rewritten, I wouldn't have known what he did. But he, being the sort of fellow he was, he just struck out the 14th and he writes in the 11th. And he moved that election from Tuesday to Saturday. Now, why? For the same reason that up there in Ottawa 20 years before. He knows what's going to happen and he's going to get the job done while the courts are in recess over the weekend. So he moved the election from Tuesday to Saturday. And the amazing thing to me is I could not find where any contemporary writer, reporter, anybody said, hey, Governor, how come you're moving it to this date? And unfortunately, Sienna died in the meantime. You know, I, if, I would, if I had uh, seen that proclamation during his lifetime, it would have opened up a whole okay. But knowing the guy as I did, <laughs> I knew exactly what had happened. He, he, he wanted the weekend to get the job done and everything else. And it was done and that was it. 